Good morning, church. Good morning. That sounded so great. It is such a privilege to be able to serve uh, with you guys today and to be able to bring God's word. Uh, As you're probably aware that I'm usually standing over here somewhere on the platform with a bunch of other guys and girls um, leading worship, and uh, to, to this morning, it's, it's cool to be able to switch it up a little bit and bring a message. So I'm really excited. I'm really thankful. God is so good, and uh, I'm looking forward to digging into God's Word here today. I want to jump right in to Psalm uh, chapter 112. So if you have your Bibles, please feel free to turn there this morning. Uh, if you're on the app, look uh, on the app there. And um, if you're using another Bible app, feel free to just go right to Psalm 112. I'm going to bounce back to Psalm 111 as well this morning. So I uh, just want to make you aware of that. So right here in Psalm 112, I'd love to read these words. It says, praise the Lord, Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with the man who deals generously and lends who conducts his affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph over his adversaries. He has distributed distributed freely He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. The wicked man sees it and and is angry. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desires of the wicked will perish. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your holy word. I pray that, Father, your word would come alive to us as your word is so good. Lord, may you move freely in this place. Soften our hearts now that we might be able to to lay ourselves down, but take up more of you and be made more like you, that we would leave this place differently than when we came in today. Thank you, God, so much for who you are. Thank you for your word. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. The title for this message this morning is Blessings for the Godly. Does anybody in this room want a blessing? Come on. I know for me, I love blessings. I, when I was in college back in the day, uh, there used to be this guy at the school. He'd say, hey, Ben, you want a blessing? And I would always say, well, yes. Until I learned, I mean. Until I learned. Because then he'd be like, well, take this mop and mop that floor. <laughs> and I'd probably give him the strangest look, right? And, but, but his point was, is, is if you want a blessing, there's some work involved. Like, and your blessing will be that of the work. I'm not paying you. You're not going to get anything in return for it. Just help out. And when you help out, you'll get a blessing. I'm just bringing that up because I think for so many of us, we can easily agree that we like blessing. We get excited about blessing. Now, back again when I was in college, uh, it was cool. I went to a Bible college, Davis College, down in Binghamton, and... uh, I always kind of got a little jealous of all these ladies that were like totally on fire for the Lord. And they had this, this chapter in the end of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 31, which is this chapter about a woman of noble character. And they're all like, yeah, a woman of noble character, let's go. I mean, there's radio programs, there's ministries about the Proverbs 31 woman, there's books about a Proverbs 31 woman. But I started to ask the question, what is for the guys? What... What do I get? You know, I want to be a man that's after the Lord's heart too. I want to be a godly man, but what's in God's word for for the men? Now, disclaimer, and I probably have a bunch of disclaimers here today. This scripture that we've read isn't just for the guy. It's for the guys and the girls. Thank you, God, for your holy word. But he revealed this to me when I was in school, and it became one of these passages of scripture that I've held on to ever since. I've desired to be this Psalm 112 man. So as we're in this summer series in the Psalms, Pastor Rob asked me if I would teach and preach on a psalm. 
And for me, this psalm was easy. This was the psalm that I wanted to teach because it means so much to me. Little did I know there would be a whole lot more to this psalm than what I thought. God's word is alive and it is active. And we need to dig in, we need to search and see what his word has to say to us. So I'm excited to be able to share this psalm. This is kind of why I've picked this psalm. If you are following along in the notes on your app, you'll see my outline right there. But I just wanna kind of start with talking about the background of this passage. Psalm 112 does not stand alone. It is really connected with Psalm 111. These psalms together are identical in their structure. They're both these acrostic poems, beautiful poems about God. And uh, each, what's so cool is each one of them has 22 lines of scripture. Um, each verse begins with the successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So they're, they're moving right along. Each one of them is so beautifully written and designed that each, each line of the Hebrew starts with the letter, the next letter of the alphabet. So they're beautifully written. They're identical in their length. There's some identical stanzas and some identical phrases. They really are a matching pair. But what I think is so cool is as I continued in my study, Psalm 111 is really all about God. And Psalm 112 is all about the godly man or woman. Now, as I was digging in and studying, what I began to learn was that these psalms beautifully work together to show us that we are who or what we worship. We are who or what we worship. So if we, if we begin to read in Psalm 111, we will see who God is. We will learn more about God, and I'll, I'll look more into that in just a second. But if you look at Psalm 112, you start to see these, these attributes of God coming onto the man that desires God. We are who or what we worship. And if you take a pause and just think about that for a quick second, whether it's the word of God, maybe it's a sports team, maybe it's a TV show, maybe it's something that you're shopping for. But it can be so easy to, to start, when, when, we, when we've set our mind to something, when we begin to worship that thing, we think about it, it consumes our mind, it consumes our thoughts, it takes our value. And, and maybe we don't turn into an inanimate object, that's not what I'm saying. But when we start to think about something so often and so much and that, that thing that we worship, we become more and more like that thing. We desire that thing. So today, I hope and I pray that we will see a little bit more of who God is and what God is about and we will become more like our God. Amen. 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 So beautifully, uh, again, together, both of these psalms Start with what we see here, Psalm 111, Psalm 112. It starts with a praise the Lord. And in the Hebrew, that's a, a word very similar to the word hallelujah. So both of these passages just start off with a hallelujah. Can everybody say hallelujah this morning? Hallelujah. It's fun. Um, so, so they both start off with a praise the Lord, a hallelujah. Thank you, God. You are good. Now, just really quick, the theme of Psalm 111 we see the theme of Psalm 111 right in the first verse. I give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Right off the bat, the psalmist is writing, I give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart, everything that is in me, all of my being. I focus it on God. I give it all to God. It's all about him. But why? It goes into more of who God is and what he's about. Verse 2 and we see this uh, three times in this passage, in, in Psalm 111. Three times, great, verse two, great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Great are his works. You can see it in creation. You can see it by what he has done. Great are his works. Verse six, he has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the inheritance of the nations. This refers to a lot of what has happened in the Old Testament and the deliverance of, of God's people. Verse seven, the works of his hands. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts, all his word, all his law 
are trustworthy. So as the psalmist begins this passage, I give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. He has been meditating. He has been dwelling. He has been thinking about the works of God. This is the very thing that he values. And if you take time on your own to read more of this um, Psalm 111, you will see more of the attributes of God reflected throughout the chapter. But again, I want to focus more of our time on Psalm 112 here today. Psalm 112, the theme of this is a little bit different. Although the, the Psalm 111 starts with, I give thanks to God, we look at who God is. Psalm 112 begins with this, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. This psalm begins a little differently. In fact, again, we see how Psalm 111 and 112 work together. Because Psalm 112 begins with how 111 ends. If you look at verse 10 of Psalm 111, it says, Fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All uh, those who practice it have good understanding. His praise endures forever. And then again, we see in Psalm 112, Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. It's important to see that uh, this psalm actually ends with a, or excuse me, begins with a beatitude. Uh, I believe Pastor Rob talked about this a little bit last week, but this psalm begins with a beatitude, and it's, a beatitude is essentially a blessing that is usually a promise. Uh, if we think about Scripture, uh, Jesus in Matthew chapter five, we see the beatitudes when Jesus is speaking in the Sermon on the Mount. Real quick, I can just read a few of these in chapter, Matthew chapter 5, verses 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. A beatitude is a blessing that is also usually a promise. Psalm 112 begins with a beatitude. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. And through the rest of this chapter, we see the blessing. We see the blessing. We'll talk more about the, the blessing, but I want to focus really diligently right now on Psalm 112, verse 1. What, we, what is so important about this verse? Blessed is the man. Yes, I think that we a majority of us raised our hands seeking blessing. We like blessing. Blessing is good. But look at what the word of God teaches us and look at what it tells. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. We can start right there. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. Now, this isn't that we tremble in absolute terror, although it's not far off. This is more of a profound reverence for who God is. Throughout scripture, we can see God's good character, but we can see his strong hand. We can see that he is holy. We can see that he is awesome. We can see that God is majestic and that he is completely opposed to sin or anything that is not holy. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. This is a profound reverence. And for each and, of, each and every one of us, we should take heed. How is our heart toward God? Do we have this profound reverence to a most holy God? Amen. Continuing in verse one, who greatly delights in his commandments. I feel like this is pretty self-explanatory who greatly delights in his commandments. At the beginning of the week, I had the opportunity to join one of my friends in Tennessee. We were able to go on a whitewater rafting trip. It was absolutely beautiful. Then we were able to go into the mountains of Gatlinburg, where if you've never seen it, it's really neat. Check out some pictures. Maybe you can go visit yourself. But the mountains are beautiful. There's black bears running around. It's wild. But interestingly enough, even though it was a time of rest and a time of relaxation and vacation, I was able to get away, have a lot of fun. We got to the hotel, some things were messed up. What I was realizing was with a little bit of, well, not a whole lot of sleep that night, I hadn't spent time in the Word of God. I was really agitated, and I found myself very irritable. 
I immediately, when we got to the room, we checked in, we settled in. I just knew that what I needed was to take some time and get into God's word. So I went away, I got alone, I opened up the word, and I began in my devos. And immediately, just being in God's word, God's word, just in my quiet time, you know, I start to feel this, this stuff that I had in me, these bad vibes, right? Just going away because I'm spending time in God's living, awesome word. Yeah, it's so cool. And I just thought, wow, like how easy is it for me? Here I am in this beautiful country, this beautiful uh, like woods, bears, so cool, whitewater rafting. In and of itself, it didn't satisfy but I found so much joy in, in just digging into God's word. Blessed is the man that fears God. Blessed is the man who greatly delights in his word. And I just added, and if you're looking in your notes, I think that this goes hand in hand with what we are learning. If you fear the Lord, if you're digging into his word, if you greatly delight in his commands, obedience is part of that. Obedience is part of that. The godly obeys God. And what's cool is as our hearts are sanctified and we begin to seek the Lord more and more, our hearts should greatly delight to obey God, not just out of obligation, but we should desire it in every situation. We should seek to obey God. So verse one is just loaded and it really sets the stage for the blessings to come. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. I hope that you and I can be a people that fear the Lord and greatly delight in his commandments. Because this is where we start to see the blessing. This is where we get these things that will excite us and like, whoa, here we go, God, please pour out. Now, these first two blessings that I want to cover, again, I said that there would be some disclaimers this morning. God's word is so good, and it is so true. But as I dug in this scripture, there's some of these great things that I just want to, for us to have proper expectation. God is faithful. He is good. He never lies. But also, too, some of these principles are general. First, right off the bat, Let's look at verse two. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. As we go through these blessings, I will just kind of point out and or encourage for, for if you're following along in a paper Bible, if you underline or if you like to circle or if you're taking notes some other way, um, I have underlined the blessings. I have underlined the blessings, but with each of the blessings, there's kind of this, this command that goes with it. So I circled those. So I'll just kind of speak those out as I work through these verses. His offspring will be mighty. Now, mighty is the underlined word. That's the blessing. This word doesn't mean like physically strong. I know some people that are really strong that work out and they're pretty mighty. But this word might here is a little bit different. More or less this idea, this blessing is to see one's offspring know God and to have high moral standards. Mighty is to be known and to have high moral standards. I don't have any children. I pray one day I do have children. I pray that I do continue to follow in the footsteps of the Lord and what the truths of scripture say. I hope that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I hope that my offspring will be mighty in the land. And I hope that they are known for having high moral character. But I also see here in Scripture is part of my responsibility to live an upright life. It says it right there, verse 2, his offspring will be mighty in the land. The mighty is the blessing. The generation of the upright, that's what I got to do, will be blessed. Disclaimer, God is faithful. We can see through Scripture that there are men that follow God, that sometimes their kids don't end up walking with the Lord. 
I would never want to stand up here and teach and speak and say, if you do this, you get this. If you follow God, you will be rich. If you follow God, your kids will be perfect. No. But God's word is still good and it is still true. And as we seek the Lord, as we seek to follow him, we just might see really good things happen. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Verse three, wealth and riches are in his house and the righteousness endures forever. Wealth and riches is obviously the blessing that we would desire here, but the work is righteousness. Praise God that Jesus has righteousness on our behalf, but nonetheless, is it in the forefront of your mind to desire righteousness? Do you want to be righteous? This is for the men and for the women. Um, Again, this is a general principle. There are certainly righteous people amongst the poor. For us to say that the righteous are rich and only the rich are righteous would not be a true statement. But the word of God also does say that there are riches for those that desire wisdom and those that pursue wisdom. But I do also want to just say in regards to this verse in particular, there's an amazing verse in 1 Timothy chapter 6 that says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. And I think that we'll end up landing this passage in a place where the purpose is godliness. The purpose isn't the blessing. The purpose is godliness. Godliness with contentment is great gain. I also considered a verse in Proverbs that says, Father, give me neither riches nor poverty. Give me just what I need. Because if I have riches, I might say, who is God? And I might do my own thing. But if I'm poor, I might steal and dishonor your holy name. So when I read that wealth and riches are in his house, that's kind of a little interesting right there. I grew up in a home that loved the Lord. I wouldn't say that my home was financially wealthy. But I feel like my home growing up was very rich and God's goodness, and God's grace, and a little bit of God's favor. Let's continue on. Verse four, light. Light is the blessing. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. Light dawns. Have you ever gotten in your car at night and started driving and realized it's really dark because your headlights aren't on? Me and my friend that we were just driving out to Tennessee, he just got a new car. And he wasn't quite sure how to turn his headlights on. So here we are going down the road and he's trying to see the buttons on his steering wheel. He's like, man, I can't see the buttons on my steering wheel. I'm like, let me help you out, bro. I reach over his steering wheel very carefully and I flip this little switch. And his headlights turn on. And the lights in his car turn on. And he's like, oh, He just had like these running lights out and, you know, out in front of the car going down the road, going down the highway. So there was light, but there wasn't the fullness of light. When you flip that switch on, you get this light and it's so bright and it lights everything up the way it should be. I think about the Hebrew people back in the day. They didn't have the luxury of being able to flip a switch and see the lights turn on. So this analogy is is weighty. This analogy is, is written in their time. When it was dark, it was dark. When you'd go outside, you'd stub your toe because you can't see. So there's great value here that light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. Light is the blessing. Living in grace, mercy, and righteousness is the command. And I want to correlate, again, as I said, Psalm 111, which is all about God, correlates with Psalm 112, which is all about godly character for us. If we look at verse 4, the end of this correlates strongly with verse 4 of Psalm 111. It says about God, he has caused the wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. 
As we worship our great creator and our God and we seek him in his word, we will become more like him because we become like the thing that we worship. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. Why? Because our God is gracious, righteous, and merciful. These are some good blessings. Verse five, there's more blessing. There's so much more blessing. Verse five, it is well with the man who deals generously in lens, who conducts his affairs with justice. The blessing here is actually kind of this idea if it is well with the man. Good, good is another word that is used here. Good will come upon the one that lends and conducts his affairs with justice. I don't know about you, but good sounds good to me. Sometimes it can be rather difficult to lend and be generous. Sometimes it can be hard to be just. But these are all characteristics that are well known in our Heavenly Father. Verse five, as it says, it is good with the man who deals generously in lens. It's interesting to me that verse five in Psalm 111 says, he provides food for those who fear him. Almost meaning that good can just be like a good meal. Next time you eat a meal, remember God's goodness. It is well with the man who's generous in lens, who conducts his affairs with justice. I'm going to quickly correlate verse six, seven, and eight together in a grouping. For the righteous will be, uh, excuse me, for the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. Verse eight, his heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries and or his enemies. This word isn't written specifically in this portion, but the blessing really is stability. The blessing is stability. And it really comes when we choose to trust the Lord. When we cho- Verse seven, trusting in the Lord. When we choose to trust the Lord, but how do we know that he is trustworthy? How do we know that he is good? Well, Psalm 111, verse seven. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. When I was on this little trip, I went out on my balcony and I'm spending some time just out at night uh, and there's some folks on the balcony like next to me. And I overheard this young lady talking to another lady, and she's just sharing about how anxious she is all the time and how she's very desperately trying to learn how to cope with her anxiety. And she's talking about different substance issues amongst her friends. She's talking about her substance issues, and she's saying, like, I need to do this in order to alleviate my anxiety. Anxiety is a popular topic in our culture today. And I, I didn't know how to awkwardly chime in. You know, I, when I bend kind of around the, the wall that separates our porches and be like, hello, I'm here. Let me tell you what the word of God has to say because the word of God is just so good and it's so true and, and I know that you're dealing with this anxiety but, but you can have complete stability when you commit to Jesus and you trust wholeheartedly in him. But that is the truth. It doesn't mean things will be easy and that our pain just goes away. Because in this section of verse six through eight, I just want to say that there, another disclaimer, okay? Temptations with blessings. There are temptations that come with our blessings. With all of this that we've read and learned about today, there's so much good and we can desire, we can desire to, to seek God and to obey God for his blessing. That is bad because that that becomes an idol. When we put the blessing before the Lord, that's backwards. Don't do that. Seek the Lord, follow him, obey him, leave all the rest to him. 
We get this great snapshot of what can come, but leave it to him. Because with the blessing, we can experience greed. We can experience power and, and, and abuse of that power. We, we can just start desiring this indulgent living. And maybe worst of all is that we can f- begin to fear losing all that blessing. We get it. We get a taste of it. Then we want to control it again. And we can become afraid to lose it. But the godly man is, and the godly woman is stable. The godly man and the godly woman is stable. Instead of greed, choose generosity. Instead of abusing power, choose justice. Instead of indulgent living, they are steadfast, is verse six. They are faithful. They are committed. They aren't just seeking the next party. They aren't just seeking the next high. They aren't just seeking the next fun thing. They are steadfast in the Lord. They don't fear loss because they are fearless because the godly trust in the Lord. Lastly, verse nine, it says this. He is distributed freely. He is given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. Honor is the blessing. Righteousness is the work. His righteousness endures forever. Amen. Thank you, God. As we just wrap things up here, verse 9 and verse 10 will work as our conclusion. These two verses are a little bit different because they're the only verses in this entire passage that have three lines instead of two, which again can show that there's something significant about these last two verses working together. So, verse 9 says, He's distributed freely. He is given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. However, there's a balance here. His righteousness endures forever. The righteous. On the other hand, the wicked. Man sees and is angry and gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desire of the wicked will perish. We can see that there's a righteous lifestyle in fruit for righteous living, and we can also see the wicked and the result of the wicked. I don't know if you were around, but a few weeks ago, we were in Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1 is all about righteous living and wicked living. It contrasts the two. We see that again right here in the end of Psalm 112. We see that there is a balance and almost like a choice. Here's, the, here's what you get for righteous living. Here's your choice for wicked living. It's kind of funny, but I can't say that I would expect to see an adult, like, you know, if I'm living, following the Lord and the Lord is blessing or, you know, you're experiencing the favor of the Lord. You know, I have a hard time thinking of an adult looking at you and being like, why are they so blessed? It's hard for me to imagine that. But I feel like I've seen it in kids. You know, one kid might get in trouble because they actually legitimately did the wrong thing. And then another kid is like blessed because they did the right thing. And then that kid that's like now mad because he's punished is mad at his sibling because they're good. So interestingly, we might not see adults throw a tantrum in this life. But scripture is also very clear that in the end of it all, there is a place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. We might not see it in this life, but we might just see it in the next. And for those that are in Christ, hopefully we won't see that at all. Closing, do you desire to be a Psalm 112 man or a woman? Has this scripture spoken to you that you can see that there is so much value in fearing our great God and having this reverence for him and desiring to delight in his commandments, delight in his word, to let it speak into you and to obey with joy? It all all begins with falling more in love with God, fearing him, learning from him, obeying him. 
Because of his goodness, we can grow in his likeness and experience his richest blessing. I want to read that one more time. I don't want to let that pass. Because of God's goodness, not ours. Because of God's goodness, because of who he is and his character, we can grow in his likeness. We can grow to be more like him. We can grow to be more like the God that we should worship. And we can receive his richest blessing. We can receive his characteristics, just as they're written in Psalm 111. We can be the men and women that are so similar to God. I want to close with one quote from Charles Spurgeon. As I was studying in this passage, I saw this, and I was like, that's an interesting line. It says this, we are at best but humble copies of the great original. Still, we are copies. And because we are so, we praise the Lord who has created us anew in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah.